Praise God, amen. So I'm just going to ask the team. Oh, there you go. Okay, so today we're going to take a plane ride. How many want to go on a plane ride? Praise God, amen. You got your boarding pass? Praise God, you got your ticket? Okay, we're going on a plane ride this morning. So today I want to review a topic, but this sermon is going to be a different sermon. It's not going to be your usual sermon where we just say one story. This is going to be a sermon about the entire New Testament in 30 minutes. So this is why we're taking a plane, because when you take a plane from New York to California, you pass all of the states. Well, today we're going to take a plane that's going to start here and come all the way from Genesis all the way till here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the entire Bible in one way or form. And so you don't have to take any notes today if you'd like. The, the sermon uh, biblical references, you can email the church and the church will send you my entire sermon in a couple of sheets. You don't have to take notes, only if you want to. So having said that, I'm going to go through all of the books of the Bible as listed on this next slide. When we look at the Bible, if you go back to the, if you go back to the bookshelf, when you look at the Bible, the Bible is like a bookshelf. There's so many things in that bookshelf. The Bible is broken up into several categories. And so we have the first five books of the Bible that are called the Pentateuch. Then we have the historical books that talk about Israel's history. Then we have the poetic books that talk about the poetry. And then we have major prophets and minor prophets, the Gospels, the Book of Acts, and Paul's letters, the general epistles, and the prophecy, the book of Revelation. And guess what? I'm going to talk about every single book today. But we're going to do it in a condensed, condensed fashion. Praise God. So you're ready? Please put your seatbelts on. Pull up your tray tables. Please put your phone on silence mode. Actually, turn off your phones. Praise God. Because today we're going to take a look at the presence of God. And what is the presence of God? Today, I want you to leave this building, to leave this church, asking yourself, what is the presence of God? If I ask each and every one of you to describe what is the presence of God, I may hear different answers. The presence of God is God in the midst of man. The presence of God is feeling something physical of God's divine attendance in our lives. Some may say it's the audible voice of God. This Friday, God gave me an audible here right on Friday night. It is the change in the atmosphere, many of you may say, or some of you may say, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Or when God has been present, or something that's beyond the normal physical human experience is the presence of God. Or it is when God is made manifest. Or when a change happens to man because of the presence. But my personal definition is the intimacy with me and God. That's God's presence to me. It's the Shekinah glory. Praise God. So let's begin. You ready? Open up your little windows because you're going to look out your window, out into the books. We're going to start with the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis starts with the first verse, Genesis 1.1. And two, and it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and it was void, and dark darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. We see that there, the presence of God in the very beginning of Genesis, it says that the Spirit of God moved. That means his presence moved around about this earth. When we look at the presence of God in the book of Genesis, we see that even in the garden, the presence of God was there with Adam and Eve. Later, they decide to walk away from that presence of God. The presence of God is in the book of Genesis through the life of Adam, Eve, their descendants, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So let's go on to the book of Exodus. Where do we see it there? In Exodus 13. You know, a lot of times when I quote a verse, it's not because I don't know where it's found. It's because something different. I want you to read that verse in context. I could say the next verse is 13 and dash, uh, verse 20. Chapter 13, verse 20. 
But if I say chapter 13, that means you need to read it in context because it's so rich. I just can't contain it in one verse. So in Exodus 13, 20, it says that God went like a pillar, a, a, a cloud during the day and a pillar of, of, a, at night. He walked with them. It never went off. The presence of God was with the people of Israel all the time. We see the presence of God in the book of Exodus also on the Ark of the Covenant. He said, Moses, right there on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. My presence will be there and I will tell you what to say to the people of Israel. His presence was on the Ark. Let's move to Leviticus. We go to the book of Leviticus and there we see that God shows the people of Israel what proper worship is. Yes, he talks about the Sabbath and he talks about the Passover and all of the different festivals, but in there he talks about what is proper worship right in the book of Leviticus. And we see in the book of Numbers, we see in the book of Numbers where Moses was with the people and they began to complain now, we know people in this church don't complain, right? They started to complain because there's no water, and how dare you bring us over here? And what did the Bible says in, in Numbers 20, verse 2 to 6, it says that Moses was in the presence of the people, and he moved out of the presence of the people and went to the tabernacle to the tabernacle of con uh, to the tabernacle door it says and when he went to the tabernacle because he went and presented it to God so he could have stood here and gossip with them but he chose to pick himself up go to the gate of the tabernacle and guess what happened the presence of God fell on him right there it says that they fell on their faces him and Aaron and the glory of God appeared there it is the presence of God because he chose to forget that and come over to this side Give it to the Lord. In Deuteronomy, where do we find? In Deuteronomy, that's when Moses is getting ready to send the new generation right into the promised land. And here's what he says to them. He reminds them. He says there in, in Deuteronomy 12, 7, it says there in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your family shall eat and you shall rejoice and everything that you put your hand to because the Lord and, and everything that you have Put your hand to because the Lord your God has blessed you. It says there in the presence of God. So he's telling him, listen, don't be afraid. This is the new generation. This is not the ones that all had all this sin. These are the newbies. He sends them in and says, there the presence of God will go with you. Praise God. Now let's move to the historical books. Let's go to the book of Joshua, one of my favorite stories. Joshua comes before the Lord and says, God, why did you bring me here? The people of Ai and the people of the Amorites, they, they've come against us. And you're not helping. We're losing the war. Where are you, God? So he throws himself to the floor. And God looks at him and says, what are you doing on the floor? Get up, Joshua. This is in Joshua 7. Get up. Stop bowing down. The reason you're not winning is because there's sin in your camp. When you remove that thing that's in your camp that's cursed, then I'll come back. But look at what God says to him. He says, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you that's devoted to destruction. God won't help him. Sorry, Joshua, I don't care. If there's sin in your camp, I'm not helping you. And so Joshua went and took care of it. God says, you cannot stand against your enemy until you remove the thing that has been a curse. And Joshua went and took out that situation, which was a, a man who stole. And he took out Achan, removed them, and all of a sudden the presence of God came and they won the war. A lesson to us. Let's look at the book of Judges. There we see the story of many different judges. Not all judges were great. But we see that Gideon was a great judge and Deborah was a great judge. God was with them. In the book of Judges, we see the story in Judges 4 about um, Deborah and how she went. She said to Barak, aren't you supposed to be over there taking care of this enemy over Sisera? And he says, well, I'm not going. Now, what kind of a man is that? I'm not going unless, uh, you know, a woman comes. Well, praise God for the women. Amen. And so he went with her. And there they took care of the enemy. And the presence of God was in that story. It was in that story in Judges. And it was with, the Gibeon, with uh, Gibeon when he went against the enemy. He was there. The presence of God was there even though the judges were not all righteous. Now we look at the story of Ruth. We see where we see that Ruth and Naomi were taken in by a kingsman redeemer. The story of the church, how Jesus comes to pick us up. Isn't there the presence of God in that story? 
Jesus took us in. That's his greatest his greatest and you know the people of the town the town people started talking about Naomi and says praise be to God this is what the town people are saying who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer the rumor was out in the street God has never left the presence of God was with Ruth and Naomi then we look at first Samuel in the historical book of first Samuel we see David kills Goliath I don't need to tell you the story of David and Goliath, but we know that David saw that there was a reason and there was a cause that he would be there. You see, when he went to Saul and said, Saul, it said Saul went to him and said, go with the Lord, go with thee. Why did David have the presence of God? Because David honored God. Yes, David made mistakes, but he always came back with repentance. And you know what? One of the things that David did David said that he would not go and he would not stretch his hand against the Lord's anointed. That was huge in the eyes of God. You know, no matter what came to David, he said, I will not go. I don't care what, but I, even if that Saul was wrong, he did not go against God's anointed and God anointed David because of that. But you know where the presence was in that story of David and Goliath, the, the power the presence was in that stone because it wasn't the stone that killed him. It was the presence of God that went into that stone that day. There was the presence of God. In the second book of Samuel, David becomes king of Israel. And so David wants to build the temple to the Lord. And the Lord said, no, you're not going to build your temple. Your son will build the temple. But it's through David's repentance that we see in his story, the entire story of David, how God helped David. And his presence never left David. And now we go to the book of Kings, first Kings, second and second Kings. The first story tells, uh, the first book of Kings tells the story of Solomon. From Solomon all the way down to the exile, the story of the Kings. If you've never read, read the Kings, it's an amazing uh, set of books. So Solomon builds the temple and there they have a place of worship. Where is the presence in Samuel? When he brings back and he builds a beautiful temple and people were able to go and find the presence of God. And Second King has one of my favorite stories. Second Kings has the story of King Josiah. He was such a special king. Matter of fact, there's only one verse in the Bible that talks about the best king ever and that's given to Josiah. It says that there was never ever before any best king, not even David, nor before or after. In 2 Kings 23 and 25, verse 25 says that there was never a king like him who turned to the Lord and did everything with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength and according to the law of Moses. You see, what's special about that is that all the kings before Josiah were evil. And all the kings after Josiah were evil. But he stood in the middle of all these kings and all of the legacies that the other ones left behind and the future legacy. And he said, I don't care. I'm going to stand up for righteousness. And he brought the presence of God back to the people because they were so evil. They were in idolatry and all kinds of sin. And he brought back the presence of God. Praise God for Josiah. I have to meet him someday up in heaven. Let's go over. We're looking now at the book of Chronicles. In the book of Chronicles, we see that David brings back the Ark of the Covenant. It was taken out and the presence of God had left. And he went out and he brought back the covenant in 1 in first Chronicles 13 through 15. And in, in chapter 16, he emphasized national worship. We're going to worship God. We're going to bring the presence of God. God is in the midst and he's here with us. And he brings back the worship in, in uh, First Chronicle. In Second Chronicle, Israel was destroyed and the nation of Judah goes off to Babylon. But God is good and the Persian King Cyrus allows them to come back and to rebuild, the, the, rebuild Jerusalem again. There we see the presence of God. Then we get to the book of Ezra. Ezra, I love Ezra. Ezra just picks up the Bible, the Torah, and puts it under his arm. He walks to the city gate and he says, everyone, I got something to tell you. Let me tell you about God. Let me tell you about his promises. Let me tell you what's written in this Torah. And he stood in front of the gate and there many people came to listen to him. The presence of God came in through the spiritual renewal. In Ezra 7.10, it says that Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the Lord with all his heart and to teach the people of Israel all the statue and all of the, all of the judgments that would come to them. 
And here's Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the next book and he comes. He's the one that builds the temple. Now he's getting ready to build the temple. And so they, they, build, the, they build the city. And it says that once they built the, the, the walls of the city, they all rejoiced. It was like a party. The presence of God was there. You know what's the beautiful thing about Nehemiah? In Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 29, it says that the musicians built around the villages of Jerusalem, all around, they, the musicians built their homes. Isn't that amazing? Here's Jerusalem in the middle, and outside of Jerusalem are all the worshipers. Oh, would I love to live in a town that all around me are worshipers. In Nehemiah 12, how beautiful. There they brought the presence of God. What about the book of Esther, a young Jewish girl? who was raised by her guardian, her, her cousin Mordecai. And get, they get together and they bring back the presence of God to the Jewish people who thought they were going to be extinguished, but they weren't. The presence of God can be seen in the protection of the Jews and in the reflection. This is a reflection of Jesus always taking care of his people. You know what? She came to that place for such a time as that so that the Jews would never be extinguished. How many know that you can't extinguish the people of God? Praise God, we fly over. Are you looking out of your little window? You can open your window now. We're flying over Job. And Job, we see, is one of the oldest stories of the Bible. Job was a perfect, and he was an upright man, but Satan wanted to, to put his hand on him. And the Lord said, hey, you can do whatever you want. Just don't touch the soul of Job. Take everything away from him. And so we see that in the last chapters, chapter 42 of Job, he says to God, he looks to the heavens and says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can ever be withheld. He had such faith. And so we see that even till the very end, he hung on and he kept the presence of God with him. He says it in that last chapter. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain my own ways before the Lord, the righteous ways. That's Job 13. And now we go to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, we see the presence of God everywhere. Just a few verses that say in Psalm 95, it says, let us come before him into his presence with thanksgiving. In Psalm 100, he says, let us serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. And Psalm 139 says, where shall I go? And where can I run from your presence? Nowhere. It says in Psalm 16, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And then he says in Psalm 51, create in me a new heart and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I just have, you know, I had to practice that about a hundred times. Praise God. Amen. Let's just jump over to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is full of wisdom from the beginning to the end. It's all about the presence of God. There's things written in there that are just speaking to our hearts in every single day. But one verse in Proverbs 25 says, do not put yourself in the presence of the king and do not stand in the place of great men. In other words, don't worry about being in the presence of people around you. Be, wi be willing to be in the presence of God. That's it. It's not about how famous you are at work or if you're the best uh, you know, person wherever you're at. That's not about that. It's about being in the presence of God. Oh, the wisdom. Now let's jump over to the major prophetic books. We see the major prophetic books. You know, growing up, even though I grew up in church, I always read the Bible, but guess what? I always skipped the prophetic books. I never read them. I just jumped right over them and went on to the. I didn't read them because I didn't like to read them because I didn't understand them. But you know what? They're my favorite books today. I'll tell you why. 
So let's go look at Isaiah. Isaiah begins to talk about judgment. Now, all of these prophets that I'm talking to you about, they all spoke about the sin. They were pointing to Israel and their sin, and this is what you're going to get, and this is the judgment. But they also spoke about hope. So Isaiah spoke, up, spoke about those things, but he also described the coming Messiah. In the last 25 chapters of Isaiah, we see that it's about restoration and salvation and the eternal king. And there is the presence of God in Isaiah. In Jeremiah, we see that Jeremiah gets beaten up. He gets thrown into the well. He gets go to jail. He gets beaten, slapped, kicked, and all that because he's giving a message to the people of God. And they would not listen. It's like today we sit in the churches and people don't want to listen. But he went and he told them about this this, this king, this message that this is what's going to be happening in this world. Babylonians were going to come after them, but they didn't believe him. They just threw him in the well. But in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, you know what? It doesn't matter what's going to happen. He talks about in the book of uh, Jeremiah 29, he says, go, go, go to Babylon. Don't, don't, don't be miserable. Just go. Plant your houses. Build, you know, get married over there. You know, do the things you need to. Don't worry about it. Because God says, Jeremiah 29, 11, he says that I have plans for you not to harm you while you were over there, but to give you a hope and a future. And then you will call on my name and you will pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Mm, what a wonderful see Jeremiah's goal was to bring the presence of God into their lives so that they would not have to suffer but even if they went to, to the exile it didn't matter he said don't worry about it the, the presence of God is with you because he's giving you a hope and a future let's look at the book of lamentation the book of lamentation has five poems as we see here, the writer of Lamentation, which they believe could be, it doesn't say who wrote it, but it could be Jeremiah. And so he has five poems of lament. The poems of lament show the people of Israel and their condition. One of the poems talks about a widow, and that widow is personifies Israel. Here's, you're like a widow, you're crying. Then he shows like Israel like a lonely man. You're just such a lonely man. He shows God's wrath in those poems, and he shows that there will be a coming sage of Jerusalem, and he shows that people's prayer, they need to pray and ask for mercy. That's what lamentation, he was lamenting in these five poems. Now the book of Ezekiel, did you know that the book of Ezekiel is one of my favorites between Ezekiel and Daniel? I love those two books, but Ezekiel might be my favorite. I'll tell you why. You see, in the book of Ezekiel, there is a clear presence of God. When you open the book of Ezekiel, the first chapter, there he is, Ezekiel, sitting by the river on his 30th birthday. You know, that was really special. Around 30, they make you a priest. And so he was sitting there by the, and all of a sudden, he looks up, and up in the skies, there's this throne. The throne of God is coming to, I mean, how many times you're sitting at home, and you see the throne of God. He showed them the throne of God. And he said to Ezekiel, I need you to communicate a message to the people. And here's what he said. He was already in exile. He said, the messages that I'm going to give to you, and this is why Ezekiel is my favorite book. Everything that Ezekiel went, he had to go do a visual. He didn't have PowerPoint or nice music, but he created his own visual. And he went and he gave the story to the people of their repentance all through the book of, through the book of Ezekiel. That's why that's my favorite book. I have to meet him and tell him there's better visuals at Ezekiel now in the earth. But you know what? In heaven, there's going to be the greatest visuals ever. That can never be. No eye has seen what God has for us. Now comes the book of Daniel. And we see that Daniel, from the beginning to the end of Daniel's life, the presence of God was there with him. You see, he brought forth messages to the kingdom, to Babylon, and to other nations. But God never left Daniel. It, did, it, it didn't matter if this kingdom was now and there was another kingdom and another kingdom and another kingdom. He went in at 14 years old. He died about 90 years old. But God never left him. The presence of God was always with Daniel. It came in the form of wisdom, interpretation of dreams, protection over. And he even gave him the revelation of end times. How many people besides John have seen the end time revelations? None but the book of Daniel and John. It was in those revelations that he saw Jesus. If you look and you read in the book of Daniel, you see that he sees this person standing in front of him. He had to throw himself to the floor and the description of this person that was before Daniel is the exact description that's in Revelation that says this is Jesus. 
so Daniel saw Jesus. Praise God. Now we're going to go down to the minor prophet, minor prophetic books. And the reason they call them minor is because their books were very short. But here's the thing about those books. Even though they were very short, they were just as important as all the other books. Because there was these messages in there that weren't contained in the other books. Let's look at those minor prophets really quickly. We see the book of Hosea. The story of Hosea, you know the story that he married a prostitute but then he forgave that story just shows the forgiveness of God that no matter what you've done in life no matter what dirty past you may have no matter what's in your life God will still forgive you and the story of God's presence was in the book of Hosea showing eternal forgiveness and love in the book of Joel we see that Joel talks about punishment to them he talks about a great and terrible day but then he also says that even in this great and terrible day there will be a time of the end where revival will come in Job 2 28 it says and it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all the flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy your old men shall dream dream and your young men shall see visions just like all the other minor prophets telling them about this is what's going to happen but if you repent there's hope there's revival there is the presence of God and then we get to the book of Amos Amos was a shepherd you see here's Amos sitting and, and God had a message for him to go so he Amos leaves this and I remember he's a shepherd he leaves his area he goes up to speak to King Jeroboam of the northern Israel he went up north and he said he had to tell them and there he said you know you guys you guys are in idol worship though you're forgetting the wealthy you're forgetting the poor people the um the people are being sold the poor people that had no money they were being sold into slavery they denied legal representation of the poor people they persecuted the prophets they were in idolatry and here's Amos running up to the north and saying I have this message for you you need to repent you need to repent but here's the thing when the shepherd goes to give a message and you refuse that message there's judgment on your head. You can't, you can't let anybody tell you, oh, listen, don't go talk to your pastor. Don't listen to their advice. Don't listen to Pastor Bill. Don't listen to Pastor Damaris. Don't listen to the elders of the church. Listen to what I am saying. When you do that, the book of Amos shows that you put judgment on your head. And guess what happened to them? Because they did not listen to that little, poor little shepherd. They didn't give any value to the voice of the shepherd. They were the first, the first portion of Israel to go. That was the northern Israel, wiped out. You're talking about Israel has 12 tribes, and you have two tribes here for Judah and 10? Which one would be wiped out first? The 10 tribes or the two tribes? The 10 tribes got wiped because this shepherd came to the people of Israel and gave a message, but they would not listen. They would not. There was judgment. They were the first to go. It says, Amos 5, 14, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as he said he would. Praise God. And so the book of Amos brings hope. Brings hope, letting them know that a messianic kingdom would be coming soon. Hmm. Let's go to Obadiah. Obadiah was one of the shortest books, only 21 verses in Obadiah. But the message of Obadiah rings true today. It's a message that's powerful, only 21 verses. Here's what he's saying in those 21 verses. You know what happened was when, when, it, when uh, Israel got attacked by the Babylonians and they got beaten and all these things were happening, guess what happened? The Edomites were sitting home, they said, hmm, there's Israel. He's getting beaten up right now. Man, we should go over there. Let's go over there and let's loot their stuff. Let's take their things. And if anybody gets in your way, just kill them. And that's what the Edomites did. And God hated that. He said in the book of Obadiah, it says, For your violence against your brother Jacob, which is talking about Israel, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. This is to the people of the Edomites. And the day, and uh, Edomite 1, 10 through uh, the first chapter, it says, it says, because of this, that you stood on either side, and, the, and in that day, the strangers carried away captives, his forces, and the foreigners entered his gates and cast lot on Jerusalem, even though you were just like them. 
but you should not have looked on the day that your brother became a stranger. You should have not gone there when the worst time of Israel, he went there at the, when Israel was at its lowest and the Edomites came in and kicked them down. When, you're, when someone is at their lowest, you don't kick them down. You raise them up and you help them. But not the Edomites. They kicked them down. And he said, you should have not entered the gate, the gate of my people on the day of their calamity. But he ends the chapter giving them hope. Giving them hope. But he reminds, don't come against, don't come against my people. Don't come against Israel because you will be punished. The nations should read that today and know that if you kick Israel, you bless Israel, not kick them down. And then we come, come on, let's all swim along. We're swimming over to the book of Jonah. Here we are, here's Jonah. You know, when Jonah was told to go speak to the people of Nineveh, he didn't want to go. The Bible says in the first chapter that Jonah went up from Tarshish and he went away from the presence of God. He fled the presence of God. And then when they got him in the boat, guess what happened? He told the people, yeah, I did flee from the presence of God. Well, that's nothing to be proud of. You don't flee from the presence of God. So Jonah had to come back to God's presence. He had to learn the lesson. He came back and God brought him back. And guess what happened? The people of Nineveh listened to the message. They were all healed. They were all delivered. And he won back and brought back the presence of God to the people of Nineveh. Now let's look at the book of Micah. Micah, this strong Micah guy. He brings the message of God's judgment. But he also talks about all of the bad things that they've done. And they would not listen. But he says, you know what? I'm still bringing a message of hope and God can still forgive you. The coming Messiah will come and he will be your deliverer. That's what Micah talked about. Then when we look at the book of Nahum. Nahum also writes to the people of Nineveh, but not during the time of Jonah. This was years later. Again, the people of Nineveh, they needed another word because the word of Jonah, they forgot. Those people forgot. Years later, there's a new Nineveh. And they, he says, you know, you need to repent. Nahum 1.7 says that the Lord is good and he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows them that will trust him. He brought back the word but this set of Ninevites did not listen and they had their punishment and judgment to endure let's go to the book of Habakkuk we all know Habakkuk I guarantee there's no one here that does not know Habakkuk you know why because Habakkuk was a complainer he always was complaining about everything how many know Habakkuk a complainer we all know someone who likes to complain a lot Habakkuk was a complainer you see when he spoke to God he went up to God and says God I'm up here in this high tower. I'm watching your people, God. Listen, I'm up here. I'm taking care of your people. But these people in Israel, they are just so evil. When are you going to come after them? When? Can you, can you get them now? And God said, no. I will take care of Israel. They're going to get their punishment through Babylon. So you think that Habakkuk will stop complaining? He turns around to God and says, but God, let me tell you about the Babylonians. They're just as worse. Now he keeps complaining. And God says, I will take care of them. Don't worry. I'll take care of them. And so the end of the story in this little short book is that, that um, Habakkuk knows that there's no alternative. You've got to come back to the presence of God and God will take care of it. He had to realize that it wasn't what he was saying to God. Get him now. Get him now. It wasn't now. It's when God says that he would get them and God did. And so in the back of three, in the last chapter, he talks about how he had to just come back and trust God. Okay, God, I'm going to trust your judgment. And he did. He even prayed in that chapter. Let's look at the book of Zephaniah. We see that in Zephaniah, he starts to say the same thing that the other, that the other um, prophets were saying. The only difference between his writing and the other writing is that he doesn't mention the word that the Babylonians. You see, the other one said, hey, the Babylonians are coming after you. But, uh, but Zephaniah didn't do that because Zephaniah realized one thing. That it's not the Babylonians that are coming after you. It's God who has the presence in him that will take care of you. And so he wrote to them, you guys need to, you guys need to listen to the day of the Lord's judgment would be coming on Judah and Jerusalem. But he also ends that there is a greater purpose and a greater restoration and safety coming to his people. Then we come to the book of Haggai. We see that Haggai comes to the people and he starts saying, you know, you guys should rebuild the temple. He talks to them about rebuilding the temple. And he gives them a message of hope to bring back the presence of God. And they do, they listen. 
They come to rebuild the temple. In the book of Zechariah, Zechariah is just an amazing book. You see, in the book of Zechariah, when he spoke to the people of Israel, he did it in a way that was different. He used, God gave him visions. So you see how God uses many different aspects to bring forth a message. In the book of um, Zechariah, there's eight visions that God gives him. But when you read all of the eight visions and what they stand for, they had this one message for all eight visions. This was the message. It says that, you know, that God would bring forth prosperity to his people. God will comfort Zion again. Those, that, those kingdoms that came against them, like the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, God will defeat your enemies. And he says that God's promise that Jerusalem will be expanded. Don't worry, you're not going to be this little people. We're going to expand you even greater. He's going to restore Israel as a priestly nation. And God once more would build and help them build the foundation of the temple. And God's judgment would be against all those who disobeyed. God would deal with them, and the judgment would be over their enemies. That's what the eight visions stand for. Hey, it's everything that the prophets have been telling you, but in a different way, in a dream. At the end, he ends the book of, Ze of uh, Zechariah, saying that the city will become like a new garden of Eden, and the river of living water will flow out of the temple and bring healing and restoration to the creation. There it is. Okay, we're almost ending the, um, the, the Old Testament with Malachi. We see that Malachi, he saw that the people were doing wrong things. There was five things that he said they were doing wrong. And he went out and he told them, listen, you guys, you can't do this. He reminded them that God loves his people because he made a covenant with them. He reminds them that they are not to despise God and they are not to defile the temple. He reminds them that they not divorce their wives. You see, because back then the men were divorcing their wives. Oh, I don't like those beans. That's it, I'm divorcing you. And went with someone else. But here's the problem when they divorce these wives. When they divorce their, the wife of their youth, they went and fought, and then the new wives, they were honoring the gods those ancestral gods they were honoring and then that is a betrayal to God you're going to leave your wife and you're going to come over here and you're going to honor another God total betrayal to God and that's what he talks about and then he 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 says that the people have been unjust and the one thing he wanted to remind them is that they were stealing from God you guys have stole from God how did you steal you stole with the tithe. He says, you guys are not even tithing. If you are not tithing, if you are not a tither, I encourage you to be a tither. And don't say, oh, you know, oh, you just want the money for the church. No, anything that comes into this church goes back into the church. We're not asking for the tithe, but there's one reason we need you to tithe, because God will bless you. You want to see blessing in your finances? Oh, why can't I save? Why can't I accomplish my goal? Why, can't, why? because you're not tithing? So he said, I can't tithe. Then put $5 in every day and call it a tithe. And I'm going to tell you right now, God is going to start to honor you. Well, Micah said, you guys are not even tithing. You're not even tithing. But Malachi brings the presence of God to Israel. And so we see that's how the Old Testament concludes. I'm not going to go book for book through all of the, the New Testament because we would take us long. But I will say this, that in the Gospels of Christ, we see the incarnate presence of God. That gospel talks about Jesus Christ. You can't get better than having Jesus Christ on the earth or standing next to you. That is the presence of God. God says that he sent the word and he became flesh and he dwelt upon, upon us. And we have seen his glory and glory and the glory of his son from the father full of grace and truth. John 1 14. And in John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to become presence in this world for us. So that we would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world. But to save each and every one of us. To bring forth that incarnate Jesus. The, the gospels say that Jesus is the, the uh, indescribable gift. The word of God says that. And so we see that gospels has the presence of God. I and the father are one is what Jesus said. And in the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. Can you get better than that? The presence of God coming from the heavens, opening and shooting right there, letting you know, look, we have the presence of God. 
We have the presence of God, we, each and every one of us, because God blew it into us. We have his Holy Spirit. When we look at the epistles, Paul wrote about 13 epistles. And all of them, he went preaching to all of the different areas, to the Romans and the Corinthians and the Galatians, into the Galatians, the Ephesians, all of them, Thessalonians. He went and spoke, and every time he went somewhere, he brought the presence of God with him. In places that were desolate, where there was no one talking about God. In places like when he walked into, into the book of Acts, Acts 17, he says he walks into, into Athens. There was no God there. Matter of fact, they just had a little, a, little, a little area that says this is for the unknown God. And so what happened? Paul comes and he brings the presence of God right on there onto the unknown God. He brought the presence of God everywhere that he went. I need not go through all 13 books to tell you that he brought the presence of God till the day he died the presence of God was with him when we look at the general epistles these are epistles that were not written by Paul these are the ones that were written by others when we look at the general ep ep epistles we see in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is our high priest there's the presence of God we don't need any more sacrifices we have the priest among us in the book of James, we see that James was the one book that I will say that had the same verbiage that came out of Jesus' mouth. Same exact wording. Why? Because James was his brother. And so James had to sit there during dinner time and listen to Jesus talk and talk and talk. And all these things were in his mind. And he didn't believe Jesus, but then later he believed. And guess what happened? Everything that he learned from Jesus at the dinner table, he brought back. He became the pastor of Jerusalem and he brought back. And he said, you know, all that that my brother, my, the, my savior brought, I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to bring it. And so when you read the book of James, you're reading Christ's words. So beautiful. There is the presence of God. Amen. And we see, praise God, in the, the rest of the books. Amen. In First Peter, we see that we are called the chosen people, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, holy nation, because we have the presence of God in us. We see that um, in the book of, in the book of, uh, that's right, in First Peter, and in First uh, John three two says that we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, and we shall see Him as He is. There is our hope that the presence of God is within us, and we're going to be with that presence. In the book of Jude, it says in Jude 1, 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power from now forever, amen. There is the presence of God. He's the one that could bring us into the presence of God, the presence of his glory. And then we end with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, we see the presence of God throughout the entire book. The entire book, you see the presence of God, of future times coming. This is what Daniel wrote about. And so we see that in Revelations 21, it says, I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And there I saw prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, look. Look, that's God's dwelling place among the people he is. And he dwells with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear and every, every tear from their eye. And there will be no more death and no more crying and no more pain. For the order of all things have passed away. We see it there as John is looking up says, look, look, that's us. He's looking at us in the future. Look, there's God in his dwelling place with his people. We will be in the presence of God, in the full presence, because his word says we get to hang out with him, and we get to glory and bask in that presence. You know, in Revelations 21, 22, it says, I have not seen, I have not seen a temple in the city. Now, here's John talking about all the things that he saw, but he didn't see a temple because your Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are in the temple. We don't need a temple because we're going to stand in his presence. And just being in his presence and the presence of the Son and the presence of the Holy Spirit is enough presence to be that you do not need any more walls, no more buildings, no more churches. Being in the presence of God is the most amazing thing. And I'll conclude with this. Let's go back to the book of Ezekiel. 
Remember I said it was my favorite, so Ezekiel gets extra two minutes, just so you know. The book of Ezekiel, you know, when I told you in chapter one, he says that in the first chapter, he looked up and he saw the throne of God. Well, Ezekiel kept going on and giving his message. But then one day he said, Ezekiel, come over here. Guess what happened? Let me show you what's going on in the church. And so he brings him to the church. Ezekiel 8, 6. He says, there's things that bad that are going on in the church. It says, son of man. That's what he called Ezekiel. Do you see what they're doing? It's great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go away from the sanctuary. You see, what happens is that, that Israel was sinning. They were doing idolatry. They were worshiping, worshiping Asherah poles. They were worshiping unclean creatures. They were worshiping a god called Tammuz. They were worshiping the sun. And God says, you know what? I can't be there. My presence has to leave. I can't be in that church. My presence has to leave. They're in sin. And we have to ask ourselves, are we talking about a building and a church? Yeah, he was talking about that building and that church at that time. But today he's talking about this building, this temple. This temple needs to have the presence of God. This temple cannot be worshiping other things. You can't be worshiping your TV and you can't be worshiping your phone and you can't be worshiping your best friend and you can't be worshiping for social media. You cannot. That is an idol before the Lord. Can God live in this temple? Can the presence of God fall into your, into your body and into your soul and into your spirit? Can he? If your temple is not clean, how are you going to be before the Lord? The, the throne of God was over that church and said, goodbye, I'm leaving. Look at your life. Think about your life today. Is your temple, does it have something in it? In that temple, they had things on the wall, these creatures, and they had statues and all kinds of things. They did it inside the church, and they did it outside the church. Is our internal things filled with junk? Is our physical filled with junk? We need to look, and we need to examine our temples and say, Lord, has your presence left me? Take not thy presence from me, says the psalmist David. No, I don't want to live without your presence. I don't want to exist without your presence. I don't want to be a tumbleweed. I don't want to be, oh yeah, but I go to church and I'm on this and I'm the usher and I'm that. And I'm, it doesn't matter. You could be the greatest out here, but inside you could be dead like a tumbleweed. And that's what we need to examine today. We need to say, Lord, is my temple dry? Have I felt the presence of God? Remember those things I said in the beginning? When you feel the presence of God, there's change in your life. You feel something different. God begins to talk to you. Your senses pick up the presence of God. Your soul, your spirit, everything about you picks up the presence of God. And if you're not in that place, if you feel that you've never felt the presence of God, if you've never felt God walk into your soul if you've never felt the presence of God speak into your ear if you've never felt God come close to you you know sometimes when we pray in our home you know he does the night prayers and I, I like the six o'clock morning prayers he, he likes those I like I'm an early bird he's a late bird and you know what when we come into the presence of God so many times we felt the spirit of God just walk walk into the presence he feels the presence of God and he begins to weep I feel the presence of God and I begin to dance because we felt the presence of God but I know that there's people here who've never felt the presence of God who've never heard a word from the Lord who never felt the desire to read his word to open the treasures of this book when have you read your word? When have you wanted to read your word? Is it just let me read one chapter today because that'll do the check off? No, that's not the way we read the word of God. We read the word of God with hunger, hunger in our, in our mouths and in our soul. Have we been, if we look at these books that I just showed you, the presence of God was there from Genesis to Revelation, but there's a library here today and your book is in that library can you open the book can you open your book and say is my book dry or does my book exemplify the the life of christ is my book shining before the lord can i say lord here's my book i've done everything i could and i've brought i've tried to do everything to bring your presence that's what you got to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I did everything I could to bring the presence of God into my life and into the family of my life. 
Or are we going to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, don't even open this book. It's full of cobwebs. I have nothing to bring to you. You know, the word says that we're going to bring our crowns. There's five crowns. One day we're going to bring our crown. The one that he designates for us is the crown of glory, the crown of the shepherd. And one day we want to stand before Jesus and bow down and give him our crown and say, this is what we've done for you. So today, the reason that I've asked people, uh, I've asked the, you know, the team to bring the praise and the worship at this time, to bring the praise and the worship at this time is because we switched the praise and worship. Now we're going to do praise and worship. And here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to leave. The sermon is over. The, the, we still have 45 minutes. Do we? How much time do I have? It doesn't matter. We have time to stand before the presence of God. So here's what I want you to do. Don't look at your phone. Don't open your Bible. Don't talk to anybody. Don't say you got to go home and clean your mind out of thoughts. Don't say, oh, I got to think about this pot roast and what do I got to do today? Don't do that. Give time to the Lord today. The next half hour, we're going to put the praise and worship music. I'm going to invite you to those who can come to the front and they want to. We have kneeling pads on the floor. By the way, I bought these kneeling pads. I knelt on it. Uh, you know, some people say they're hard, but I don't think they're hard. They're still good. Um, what happens is with this foam, your knee dips in a little bit and then it makes a little spot for your knee and then you feel comfortable. If you can kneel at the altar, that's fine. If you can't kneel, that's fine. Stay where you are. If you choose to sit in your chair, that's fine. But here's what I'm asking you to do, to invite the presence of God, to look inside your soul and take away those cobwebs. Take away those things. You know those things that they did in the times of Ezekiel they brought into the temple? Take them out today. Say, Lord, I can't do that anymore. Lord, can you help me? If you have a TV addiction, say, Lord, help me with this TV addiction. Don't let me turn on the TV until I've read a chapter in your word. Don't let me stare at the phone first thing in the morning. Let me, let me read your word. Let me hear your praise and your worship. Show God where you need to be, where in your part, in your life you need to clean out your temple. Clean it out today. And when you walk out of here, be a new creature in Christ. Because there's nothing more beautiful than to be in the presence of God. And you know what? We're only practicing. So when we see a Lord Jesus Christ in the heavens, that we would be prepared. You know, the end times starts out with one thing. The end time starts with the voice of the archangel. Second thing that will happen when we hear that voice of the archangel with the trumpet. The trumpet will sound. And those who have spiritual ears will hear the trumpet. Then the dead in Christ will rise. Then the righteous, the church, will rise up. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is the judgment seat of Christ. That's where you get your rewards in heaven. Then you have the tribulation happening right here on this world. The tribulation, the great tribulation will be taking place. But those who made it to heaven will join Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then his second coming will come. Armageddon will become. The Satan will be bound. A thousand years of peace will come. And the great white throne for those who refuse to listen like the people of Israel. They didn't want to listen to their shepherds. They didn't want to listen to their prophets. They didn't want to listen to the visions, to the dreams, to anything that came from God. Those will stand at the great white throne for condemnation. But we will be in the new heaven, in the new Jerusalem, where this earth will be a new earth, not this same old earth, a brand new earth, and where all evil will go into the lake of fire. So you know what? I don't know about you, but I want to make it to heaven. I want to be there. I want to say, Lord, thank you for the little tiny bit of presence that you gave me here on earth. Now I'm ready for your full, full presence of you up in heaven. So we're going to do praise and worship. It's going to be a time of reflection where you just sit by yourself. Find yourself a little corner. You can go to any corner of this church. It's upstairs, downstairs, anywhere. Find a corner or at the altar and examine where the presence of God is in your book. God bless you.